for this. Oh, that was quick. I was going to take a photo. May I take a photo of you? Because I send you greetings from America, where I'm from, California. And we have many people who participate to send my husband and me all around the world. So if I may just take a photo of you rather quickly, I will be able to tell them that you send your greetings back to America, yes? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, it is such a privilege to be here today to be able to share with you some things that I have learned over the years. Uh, so if you'll just bear with me as I get my gadgets together and we get our technology in place. I'm going to talk with you a little bit today about blessed are the peacemakers. Why do I think this is important? Well, my own journey, my own testimony is uh, that of a, a bit of a struggle through time, as I've had a lot of conflict in my own life. I was raised as a Christian, and then I walked away from my faith when I was a teenager and in my college years. And then through a series of unfortunate incidents and crises and conflict in my own life, I ended up going back to church, recommitting my life to following God, and I have not looked back since then. And so I've had time to be able to look back on my life and reflect on some of the mistakes that I've made and some of the things that I have learned from those mistakes, and I would hope to share those with you today. I am a lawyer. Don't hold that against me. My husband and I are some of the good guys. We actually do a lot to fight for religious freedom, religious liberty, traditional family values, right to life, things like that back in the U.S. When we do that kind of work as lawyers back in the U.S., we do do it for free. It's called pro bono work. So um, that is part of what we do. My husband is also a lawyer, and we both are trained in theology, and he's been to seminary, and I am about to finish. I'm very close to finishing. So why do we do this? Why do we do this combination of law and ministry? Well, partly because it actually does open doors for us. I get to speak in places I would not normally be allowed to even speak. I have trained lawyers and judges in Nigeria, and I have spoken to lawyer groups and law schools in places like Indonesia, which is the most Muslim country in the world. So it does open some doors just based on some of those credentials. But also I believe that God has called me into the practice of law in order to use my mind and to explain to others how it is so important that we use our mind. In America, we're becoming intellectually very lazy, Christians especially. We don't read, we don't study, we don't know our Bible. I love what the children were singing this morning, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. God does love us. God loves you. And how would you know this unless you read what he has written to you? His love letter to us, telling us why he created us and why we are here and have a purpose, why we are here to serve him and to serve others. Well, as a lawyer, I have done a lot of litigation, a lot of court work. Yes, my background is in theater. My bachelor's degree was in theater arts, so I was an actress for a while in Hollywood, doing film and television commercials and stage work. So I have a bit of theatrics in me. I'll try to spare you some of those theatrics today. But if I get a little animated and passionate, you'll kind of know where that comes from. So you see that background in theater kind of naturally pave the way for me to get on the stage of the courtroom floor and to be able to do trials and, and courtroom work. But the problem is, I found, it's getting harder and harder to get justice in the courts in America these days. I had good cases and where my client lost, and I saw terrible cases on the other side when they would win. And I thought, where is the justice in that? But even further, sometimes I had clients who won, and they still weren't satisfied. They still didn't feel like they had their conflict resolved, and I thought there has to be a better way of helping people. 
And so I got involved in mediation, Christian conciliation, which is helping people in conflict resolve their conflict out of court. But most excitedly, I have started studying biblical peacemaking. And I will commend to you to read this book. After the Bible, I believe this is the most important book that has ever impacted my life. And if I could encourage you to somehow get your hands on a copy, I don't know if you can download it by Kindle through the internet, but it's called The Peacemaker by Ken Sandy. And now I spend a lot of time teaching principles. In fact, I'm teaching law school now, back in California. I will be teaching legal research and writing in the fall to to law students. By the way, our law student program and uh, becoming a lawyer process is different than it is here. In America, you do not get a bachelor's degree in law. There's no such thing. So you get a bachelor's degree in something. It can actually be in anything. It might happen to be in theater. I know people who had a singing degree. And people have a political science degree and a literature degree. It doesn't matter what your four-year degree is. But then you go on to law school, and we achieve a JD degree. It is a Juris Doctor, so we are a doctor of law, in essence, when we are attorneys. And we take a bar exam. In California, it's the most difficult bar exam, and only about half the people pass. Thankfully, I passed the first time. I did not want to have to do that again. But as a lawyer, I now want to speak and help people who are in conflict stay out of the courtroom. And for Christians especially, I want to help you to resolve your conflict out of court. Now, I'm going to say some pretty radical things here today. But before I get started, I just want you to know a little bit about me. For those of you who were not here for the conference this weekend, I, I talked a little bit about my family. This is my husband here on the left. This is us. We do travel quite a bit together. We have practiced law together. We've done ministry together. And you can imagine, as two lawyers and two uh, theologians, we have some pretty lively discussions. And we have found ourselves in conflict in times. And I have had to employ some of these principles. The principles that I will be teaching you here today, you can use whether you're in conflict with someone in your family, whether you're in conflict with someone in the church, Whether you're in conflict with someone at work, it can even be used for countries that are in conflict, religious groups that are in conflict, tribes that are in conflict. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a bit. These other three lovely ladies are our daughters. They are grown, and they are um, all doing well. They're in their 20s. Jamie up on the left has autism. So she has a a form, it's called Asperger syndrome. So she's a little bit late blooming, but she's just discovering her love for the Bible and the scriptures. Katie is on the right. She's getting her second degree. She's studying science and uh, x-ray technicians and things like that. And then Megan on the bottom is the youngest, and she is a reporter in Las Vegas covering politics. You can imagine how exciting that would be in Las Vegas. And then down on the right is my dog, Callie. And I use her in some of my presentations because I point her out as being a creature that is very smart. She knows how to think, but she doesn't know how to think about what she thinks about. We, as human beings, know how to think about what we think about. We are the only creature of all of creation, of God's creation, that is able to think about what we think about. Just to give you a quick example, if I'm hungry, I don't just go eat. I might be able to think about, why am I hungry? I just ate an hour ago. I shouldn't be hungry. So you see, I can think about what I think about. I can also think about what I'm feeling. We don't often do that. We don't think about what we're feeling. We just feel, and we just want, and we just desire. And I'm going to show you how, if we don't learn how to take these thoughts captive, we create idols in our life without knowing it. And we are serving something other than serving God. So my message today is called Blessed Are the Peacemakers, and it's based on this passage here that Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. 5, 6, and 7 is generally called the Sermon on the Mount. But I particularly focus on this one verse today. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read this voice, I said, (laughs) read this verse, I wanted to be a child of God. Do you want to be a child of God? Then you must learn to be a peacemaker. And the scripture is filled 
with instructions on how to be a peacemaker. Conflict is everywhere. It's in our lives. I say where two, where two or more are gathered, there will be conflict. Now, especially in church, you get two or three Christians together, and I can guarantee you there will be conflict. You will quarrel over how to spend money, whether to spend money with new chairs or whether to get a new sound system. Or we have resources. Uh, how are we going to spend those resources? What are we going to do with, with the children? How are we going to educate them? Or what style of music? Are we going to have new songs? Or are we going to sing old hymns? And you have a differences of preferences, and people can quarrel over those things. So conflict is everywhere. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that conflict is an opportunity. Dare I say, maybe even a gift from God. Now, how many of you hate conflict? Most of us do. Okay, tell me if you like conflict. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I didn't think so. Nobody loves conflict. We don't like conflict. But God was the first reconciler because we were born in sin. You remember the story from Genesis 1, 2, and 3. God created Adam and Eve, and he created them in the garden, and it was a perfect world in a perfect environment. And Adam and Eve had everything that they wanted, but what did they do? They sinned against God. They ate the forbidden fruit. They disobeyed God, and that sin created a separation between humanity and God. We became enemies of God. And we inherited Adam's sin nature. So we all are born into sin and the sin nature. We all sin by, have a sin nature just from inheriting it, and then we all sin as well. If you've ever told one little white lie, you have sinned. If you've ever had an angry thought against someone, you have sinned. But we, God didn't leave us there. While we were enemies of his, he loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to live and to die a horrible death, to suffer for us. But then by his death and resurrection, we can have new life if we embrace who he is, if we trust him, we follow him, we believe him. God sent Jesus to show us how much he loved us. That is the great message, is God's love. But God demonstrated that through conflict the conflict that we have with him as sinners. He reconciled, provided the way for us to be reconciled to him through his son Jesus. Now we know from the scriptures, God calls us to be ambassadors of Christ. Those of us who call ourselves Christians, who believe the story of Jesus and his birth and his death and his resurrection, we believe that we've been set free from our sins by accepting him into our lives, We now have this ability, through the Spirit in us, to become ambassadors of God. We represent God now to other people. We were created to be in God's image, but that means we should be reflecting him to other people. And how do we do that? Well, we become Christians. We have the Spirit in us. We now have a power that is greater than the sin power in us to enable us to do things we would not be able to do, including resolving conflict in a biblically faithful manner. So let's think of conflict as an opportunity. Okay, what is this opportunity? What is this radical thing? How do we see conflict as an opportunity or maybe even a gift from God? Well, might I suggest that if we look at conflict as an opportunity for us to glorify God, for us to serve others and for us to become more like Christ, it can be a gift, right? Okay, but for that problem and being able to overcome that problem in a biblically faithful manner, we might not be able to show God to other people. God showed us his glory by sending his son and to die for us. So he, Jesus, is our example for us to follow. So I'm going to follow up on this so that you understand. How do we do this? Okay, those of you who were here at the conference the last couple of days, you, you realize I am all about being practical. I don't want to stand here and just give you a bunch of Bible verses and theory and philosophy. I want to give you some things that are going to help you in your everyday life. 
I'm imagining that all of you, as you sit here right now, can think of someone you're in conflict with. Maybe it's the person next to you. I don't know. Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's your grandchildren. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's someone in this church. I hope it's not the pastor, but you know what? We are not training pastors at the seminary on how to deal with conflict in a biblically faithful manner. So what we do is train peacemakers. One of the things I do is help to train other people in the church and also other lawyers on how to do this. You don't have to be a lawyer or a mediator to do this. You can learn these principles in your everyday life. And then once you learn it, you can help other people in conflict as well. Because remember, as God comforts us, we comfort other people. So let's talk about how to do this. How to actually resolve conflict in a biblically faithful manner. Well, according to this book, Ken Sandy has put together this clever little four four G's is what we call it. It just helps you to remember it. We like to have easy things to remember, don't you? I want you to walk away from this service today and remember that conflict is an opportunity to glorify God, to serve others, and grow more like Christ. And for you to think about these four G's. The four G's, how we can deal with conflict in a biblically faithful manner is to, number one, glorify God. Number two, we get the log out of our own eye first. Number three, we gently restore the other person who has sinned against us or we have sinned against them, and then four, go and be reconciled. So let's talk about the first one. What does it mean to glorify God? Well, as I mentioned the last couple days, when you are in a situation, we usually get just emotional. If you're in a conflict, the first thing we do is get upset, right? We get emotional. We do not want to be ruled by our emotions. We want to take charge of our emotions. Emotions are not a bad thing, The Bible has given us an indication that God has some emotions. I think they're slightly different. They may be metaphor, but they're pictures for us to understand that God also has some kind of emotions. You know, Jesus wept. We have verses that say God smiled and God laughed, right? God actually mocks uh, the, the enemy, Satan, who claims to do much but can do nothing because he has no power. He has no power that God has not allowed him to use. Let's put it that way. So... How do we glorify God? The first thing we want to do is to stop in the conflict and to think. Stop and think. You have a brain. You are made in the image of God. He gave you a brain and a mind to think. You can stop and take your thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. You can renew your mind. You can change the way you respond to things. But it does take practice. It doesn't come easy. Why? We are so used to operating in the flesh when it comes to conflict. We get upset, and then we dwell on how upset we are, right? Someone does something hurtful or says something mean to you. You're disappointed. You're angry. You're bitter, perhaps. We operate then out of our emotions. What do we do? We run around and we tell other people how this other person hurt us. And sometimes we as Christians hide behind gossip and call it prayer. Because we'll say, hey, this person says et- you know, such and such about me, and we need to pray for them. Well, praying for people is a good thing, but let's not use it as a mechanism by which we are gossiping about people and how they've wounded us, right? We have to be very careful about how we do that. So how can we glorify God? The first thing I want to encourage you to do is to stop and think when you're in conflict. Stop and think. Think. T-H-I-N-K. Think. Stop and think. I use an acronym to help us to remember what to do when we're thinking. T-H-I-N-K. T is what am I thinking? What am I about to say? Is it true? T. H. Is it helpful? What I'm thinking. Is it helpful? Is what what I want to say helpful? I. Is it inspiring? N. Is it necessary? And K. Is it kind? So the first thing to do is stop and say, God. Oh, I'm feeling X, Y, Z, I'm thinking, I want to say X, Y, and Z, and I know it is not honoring and glorifying to you. So what can I do in this moment to honor and glorify you? We can take this from the verse in 1 Corinthians 10, 21. Whatever you do, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. 
Pet means how you deal with someone saying a nasty comment to you, hurting your feelings, or worse, killing your children. Yeah, I had a story in Nigeria when I was working with the lawyers and training them there. I, I've been there twice and spent a whole week training each time do, uh, lawyers and judges on how to be biblical peacemakers. And as I got to the section on forgiveness, which I will get to in a minute, this woman said, I know you're supposed to forgive, but what do I do when, when it, there was a crisis going on in my town and the Muslims and Christians were running around killing each other? And this Muslim woman was a friend of mine, so I brought her into my home to hide her from other Christians that were trying to kill her. And then I needed to go get food for the family. So when I left to go get fam food, I came back, and this person I had taken into my home to help had killed my children. What do I do? That's tough. I can't pretend to stand in her shoes. I haven't lived through that. But you know what? I, I know where I'd go to answers. I'd go right here. I don't know any other place to go but to go to God and to ask him, how do you want me to respond? I feel angry. I feel hurt. I feel betrayed. I feel like you have abandoned me, God. Where do we go for answers? Right here. Number one, how do you want me to glorify you, God? I will tell you after spending some time with this woman, crying with her about her situation and urging her, let's, let's seek God's word together. Let's see what he says. And as we study the passages on forgiveness, she says to me, I must forgive. I can't teach that. I can't do that. I'm just the little vessel that gets to come alongside someone and say, let's, let's seek God together. What does he say? And then I'm there to help her as God is convicting her and moving her on what to do. The biblical peacemaking response. That's not our flesh. There's no way of explaining that kind of response other than that's God. That's why I see conflict as an opportunity. Because how we respond, if we respond in a biblically faithful manner, we can do amazing things. And it will have an impact on other people. So what can I do to glorify you, God? Stop and think. Is what I'm about to say and what I'm thinking, is what I'm about to say true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And is it kind? Step two, get the log out of our eye. Okay, we all want to point the finger at other people when we're in conflict and think about where, how they are at fault. We want to play the blame game. Well, we might recognize the sin that somebody else has done against us, and that's okay to address, but Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount here in Matthew 7, he tells us we have to get the log out of our eye first before we can help the other person with their speck. What does that mean? That means I can't help somebody else who has sinned against me until I have done an examination of my own heart first to see, do I have sin in my life? Did I contribute to this situation? Because even if I only contributed 2% to this conflict, I am 100% responsible for that 2%. So I start with myself first. And when I have discovered that I have sinned, I must go and tell the other person, I am so sorry I have sinned against you. And I teach people how to do a biblical confession. Just saying, hey, I'm sorry if I hurt you. That's not really a confession and repenting. So we go through how to give a really good biblical confession and repentance and what that looks like. Because then your heart is clear. You see, our heart is an idol factory. Our heart makes idols all the time. I don't know if you're aware of this or not. And God tells us, you will have no other gods before me. But we make other gods in our heart all the time. I call this the progression of an idol. Because we take a desire. It can even start with a good desire. And it can become a bad thing. 
we can take a desire and turn it into a demand. Okay, maybe I want to have a godly husband, let's say. That, that's biblical, right? But my husband's not doing things that I think a, a godly husband should do, so I start demanding it of him. And he doesn't do the things, so then I judge him. Well, you're not being the godly husband you're supposed to be. So now I'm going to punish you. Either I might get mad and fight and scream and argue and punish you that way by having a, an argument. Or maybe I turn a cold shoulder and I just want to have nothing to do with you. I don't want to talk to you. Or worse, divorce. This is how people get divorced in marriage. They take a good desire. They create an expectation that they're owed this. They demand it and they're disappointed. So they start judging and then they punish. They play God. I've done it. So now I recognize those idols in my, those idols in my own life. James tells us, what is it that's causing these destructive fires, the conflict, the quarrels, and the fights. What is it? It's the desires that battle in you. You want what you want, and you got to have your way. And that creates conflict, and that pours gasoline on the conflict. So you see, we're responsible on how we respond. Someone sins against us, and I start getting angry. Well, Jesus told me, if you're angry, it's like you've just committed murder. I have sin in my heart. I have to deal with that first. So the first, glorify God. Second, G, get the log out of your own eye. And the cure for this is just to confess and repent and to worship God. Sounds easy, but it's hard to do. It does take practice, and it takes humility. Number three, gently restore. This is where we want to go first. We want to go right to the other person and tell them what they've done is wrong. But if you're eager to go tell somebody what they've done is wrong, it's probably not the right time. You're probably operating in your flesh. Usually it takes some time of prayer and preparation. Go and be ready to confess your part first. And then you can say, brother, sister, can I talk to you about what you did to me that wounded me? Galatians 6 says, brother, if someone's caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. This is not about getting revenge. This is not about um, getting even. But you see, you who are spiritual, how do you achieve this? That's by doing the step before that, by cleansing your own heart first, doing that heart inspection, finding the idols in your life, finding where you have sinned, confessing and repenting. Then you can see clearly enough to help your brother who's in sin. Number four, go and be reconciled. I'm going to be closing here with the story. I don't know how I'm doing on time. I may be running totally out of time. <laughs> I may be running over. Number four is go and be reconciled. This has to do with forgiveness. So once you have gone to the other person, I've confessed my sin. It usually opens a door of trust, and the other person will automatically do it. Not always. Not always. Sometimes. Opens a door for them to confess as well. And then it opens the door for forgiveness. That is where the reconciliation happens. Forgive and resolve the problem. Bear with each other. And forgive one another if you have any grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Okay, how do we do this? I'm going to talk real quickly about this two stages of forgiveness. There's some false teaching going on in America about this principle of forgiveness. And, so, and I have argued, in fact, I argued at length with one of my professors at seminary on this issue because he said all sin can only be forgiven if there's confession and repentance from the other person. You only grant forgiveness if they have repented. That's not true. That's not biblical. We have a two-step two-stage forgiveness. There is a heart component, and that component is unconditional. This is how you can forgive people who you no longer have contact with. Maybe they're in jail. Or maybe, maybe they're dead. Maybe you, some, you have a, a parent that injured you, harmed you, abused you, and maybe they're dead, but you still have unforgiveness against them, and you're harboring that. Well, I like what Ken Sandy says, that bitterness is the poison that we drink hoping other people will die. When you harbor forget, um, uh, bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart, you are the one that is suffering. And it does hinder your relationship with God because he calls us to forgive. So when we don't forgive others, we are sinning against God. So if you don't feel close to God, 
Do a heart examination and ask yourself, do I have unconfessed sin in my life? Am I harboring any unforgiveness in my life? Are there people that have wounded me, abused me, hurt me in in my life that I have not forgiven? This unconditional part you can do on your own has nothing to do with you interacting with the other person. But you release them to God, who is the ultimate judge. He holds all things in his hand. You let him deal with that. The second is a transactional component. That's the conditional component. That is, you are only able to come back into complete reconciled relationship with the other person if they do confess and repent and you forgive them. That is the conditional aspect. Okay, so how do I give you a picture so you understand this? God, through his son Jesus, is the picture. When we were still sinners, we didn't do anything to deserve it. He sent, God sent his son Jesus to die for us. So he provided the way for the forgiveness. That was unconditional. We didn't do anything to deserve it. God just gave it as a gift. He offered it. It's an offering. But we are not reconciled to God. We can't be brought back into relationship with him unless we receive the gift. Do you see? So it's similar in our relationships with other people. Before God, we can release them from the offense. So I no longer have that sin of unforgiveness and bitterness in my own life. But I can't be brought back into a relationship with them until they have confessed and repented. Then they're able to receive the gift of forgiveness that I'm ready to extend to them. Does that make sense? I'm hoping that this is settling in your hearts. You're already stirred thinking of somebody who you need to reconcile with. Peacemaking is very hard work. And I'm going to even say that it is impossible to do apart from God. Biblical peacemaking is not possible without God and his assistance. I'm going to finish with this story. How many of you have heard of Corey Ten Boom? She helped... Uh, she and her family helped during World War II to um, rescue Jews from the Nazis. They would help hide them and uh, keep them from, from the Nazis. Well, eventually her family was discovered, and they all went off to concentration camps, and most of her, uh, Corey's family died, but Corey did not die. She was released from the concentration camp. And then she went out and spoke on forgiveness, and she had a great ministry, and she traveled And so she spoke about this one time she was in a church service, and she meets one of the SS soldiers who had abused her sister in the concentration camp. Listen to her story. It was at a church service in Munich that I saw him, the former SS man who had stood guard at the shower room door in the processing center. He was the first of our actual jailers that I had seen since that time, and suddenly it was all there. He could see it all, that room full of mocking men, the heaps of clothing, and my sister's pained face. And he came up to me as the church was emptying, and he was beaming and bowing. How grateful I am for your message, Fraulein, he said, to think that it is as you have said, he has washed away my sins. And he thrust his hand out to shake mine. And I, who had preached so often to the people about the need to forgive, kept my hand by my side. And even as the angry and vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin in them. See, she stopped and she was thinking, Jesus had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, help me to forgive him. I tried to smile, and I struggled to raise my hand, but I could not. I felt nothing, not the slightest spark of warmth or charity, and so I breathed a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. And as I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder, along my arm, and through my hand, this current seemed to pass from me to him, And into my heart sprang this love for a stranger that overwhelmed me. 
And so I discovered that it's not on our forgiveness any more than our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on him. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives, along with the command, the love itself. You can't do this amazing kind of godly forgiveness unless God works through you. You ask for his help, and he will enable you to do the impossible. Love is eternal. God showed us his love how much he loves us. Now he calls us to be his ambassador, to love others. And the greatest way we can do this is in how we deal with God. I say that it is the gospel in action. We are walking it and living it out. So I pray that you are touched here today by this message, and that you are feeling compelled to reconcile and to help others. If you want to know a little bit about my husband and my ministry, then you can just go to our website. There's some information. There's some information about the book as well. Can I please pray for you? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you are the great reconciler. We thank you that you forgive us even when we don't deserve to be forgiven. Lord, we thank you that you have charged us to be your ambassadors and to go forth and to forgive others and to help others be reconciled. God, if there's anyone in this room that is not reconciled yet to you, I pray that they would receive the gift that you so freely give, the gift of grace and forgiveness, and that they would come into an intimate relationship with you, following you, your son, your words. Your words give life. God, I think... There are people in this room that already know you, but you have stirred in them a need to reconcile with someone that they're in conflict with. God, I pray that this message of reconciliation, of peacemaking, would take root in their hearts and would bear much fruit, and this would become a peacemaking church to go out and spread peace in the community and all over South Africa. You alone are able to do this. We're only your vessels, Father. Equip us, Lord. We ask humbly in Jesus' name. Amen.